So let's discuss vector quantities. So a vector quantity is any quantity that has a magnitude and a direction. Okay, so a magnitude and a direction. A magnitude is just, it's a, another name for magnitude, it's called a scalar. So a scalar quantity is just a magnitude. An example of a vector quantity can be if you are, let's say you are driving east 60 kilometers an hour, right? The 60 kilometers an hour represents your speed, which is the magnitude. This is a scalar quantity, so that's the magnitude. The scalar is a magnitude. And the direction here is east. So collectively, this entire quantity here is your vector. Okay, so you have to have a magnitude and uh, direction. Uh, this type of vector is called velocity. Okay, there's different types of vector quantities which we'll talk about. This is called velocity because it contains a speed and a direction. The speed is the scalar, right? So this is the speed, that's the direction. Anyway, so to look at a vector quantity, uh, it's very important to indicate which direction we're headed. So in order to look at direction, we need to create some kind of system to look at direction. So there's two main systems that we're going to adopt. We're going to have something called the true bearing system. And we're also going to have the quadrant bearing system. And both of these systems are basically used to indicate direction of vectors. Okay, so I'm going to start with the true bearing system. So the true bearing system uh, kind of looks like we're going to start with the Cartesian plane, which we'll call our navigation plane or navigation rows, whatever you want to call it. And basically, we would start at zero degrees on the positive y-axis and vectors can be shown as a clockwise rotation right so the positive y-axis is your reference point it's your reference line and it's set at zero degrees right and angles are clockwise rotations from the positive x-axis positive y-axis sorry Right. For instance, if we have an angle that looks like this, right? So this is our vector, right? And let's say that the angle here is 40 degrees, right? The angle has to be a clockwise rotation from the zero degree mark. So this is your reference, right? Whoops. So this is your reference, and we're always doing clockwise rotation. Now, the way that we show the true bearing system, if we were looking at this vector and we're looking at the angle, we would write this angle as zero, four, and zero degrees. Okay, so it's always three placeholders. All right, let's say we're looking at a different angle. Let's say we're looking at an angle that looks like somewhere here, right? Well, we can understand that from this point to this point, this is 90 degrees, right? And then this could be, let's say this is like 20 degrees, right? Um, in this case, this entire angle here is 110 degrees, okay? So make sure you guys can kind of look at um, each quadrant as 90 degrees, so this is 180 degrees, this is 270 degrees, and if you do a full rotation, this is 360 degrees. Okay, so that's the quadrant bearing system. We look at three um, three place values, right? If you only have two, uh, two digits for the angle, you just put a zero to the left of it, right? But here, this is just a true bearing of 110 degrees, okay? Now, this method isn't too useful. Right? The other system, the, well, what I, in my opinion, the better system, the quadrant bearing system, is more widely utilized. Okay, so let's take a look at the quadrant bearing system. So in the quadrant bearing system, uh, what's going to happen here is our navigation rows is going to have the directions north, south, east, west. Okay. And you can think about north as being positive y. You can think about east as being positive x, uh, y, delta, uh, west as being negative x, and south as being negative y. Um, but if you're given, let's say we have a vector that looks kind of like this, and we usually represent arrows. Uh, we usually represent vectors as arrows. Uh, 
and let's say that this angle here is 23 degrees. Okay, so you can call this vector, the direction of this vector as east, from east you can go 23 degrees north, right? So whatever you write down first, um, that's where you started off. So you basically started east, so this is where you started. You started here, and then you went 23 degrees towards north. That's what it's saying. Okay, so this is the quadrant bearing system. Or what you could say is you could find this angle, and this is basically uh, 67 degrees, right? So you can also say, or north 67 degrees east. Okay, so that is your quadrant bearing system. Both of these mean exactly the same thing, right? And the reason this is 67 is because these two angles are complementary. That means that they add up to 90 degrees, right? So for instance, here's another example. Let's say we had um, a vector that kind of looked like this. Whoops, try to draw a straight line here. Um, vector that looks like this. This is, let's say this is 18 degrees, right? So if you wanted to look at the direction of this vector, you can either say west 18 degrees south, right? So from west, you're going 18 degrees south, or you can go south 90 minus 18, which is, um, what is that, 62 degrees? Sorry, 72 degrees. South 72 degrees west. So both of these mean the same thing, and you can basically look at it that way, right? So these are the two systems that we're going to mainly be using, but for the most part, I'm mainly going to be using the quadrant bearing system. Um, although you still should know the true bearing system, uh, this is just a lot more applicable for questions. Okay, next we're going to look at the types of vectors. So the two main types of vectors that we're going to be looking at are geometric vectors, and we're also going to be looking at Cartesian or algebraic vectors. I'm going to call them Cartesian vectors. So geometric vectors are just vectors in free space. A Cartesian vector is just a vector on a Cartesian plane. Vectors on Cartesian planes. Um, most commonly, Cartesian vectors are represented as position vectors. And a position vector basically has uh, the tail starts at the origin. Okay, so when we're looking at vectors, we're basically representing vectors by via uh, via an arrow, right? And this is basically the initial point of the vector. This is the the final point of the vector. You can call this the the tail end of the vector. This is the tip end of the vector, right? So basically, the vector will tell you uh, which direction the object's moving, and the magnitude will tell you how fast the object's moving, or another property of it. Okay, so this is the tail, that's the tip. And let's start with geometric vectors. So this is just vectors in free space. So there's three types of vectors that we need to consider. Three types of vectors. Right, and you can apply this for geometric as well as Cartesian vectors, right? Uh, the first type of vectors uh, is called an equivalent vector. So equivalent vectors are basically vectors with the same direction. and magnitude. Okay, so they're exactly the same, right? You can copy and paste them. For instance, if I had a vector that looks like that, let's call this guy vector A. And the way you can represent a vector, uh, if you wanted to name a vector, we use a vector arrow. So this is a vector notation, right? This is basically pronounced vector A, okay? If I compare this guy to, let's call this guy vector B, Right? If the length, if the magnitude of the vector, which is represented by the length of the vector, and the direction of the vector are exactly the same, then both vector A and vector B are equivalent vectors. And you can show this by using this notation. Vector A is equal to vector B. Right? So when we're looking at the magnitude of the vector, the magnitude of the vector is shown by the length of the vector uh, represented by length of vector, and the angle, um, the direction is represented by some kind of angle, 
um, angle from a reference point. So it's some angle away from a reference point, okay? So these two, if they have the same angle, if let's say that x, the x is the reference point, let's say that this is both 20 degrees, then vector a and vector b are equivalent vectors. And when you write the vector notation like this, where you say vector a is equal to vector b, this means that the magnitudes are exactly the same and the direction is the same, right? And if you're just looking at the magnitude, um, if you're just looking at the magnitude of the vector, if this is vector a, this is just the magnitude of vector a. So just the value of it. Okay, like, let's say for instance that this, uh, this distance here is two units, right? So let's say that this length of this vector is two units, then the magnitude of vector a is just two units. So we don't include a direction. Okay, so this is just a notation. Um, so that's only if you're looking at the magnitude. So that's an example of an equivalent vector. So this is one of the type of vectors you need to know it just means that the two vectors, or two or more vectors, are um, equal in size, equal in magnitude, length, and also direction. Okay. Now, the next type of vector that we're going to be looking at is <coughs> what we call parallel vectors. Okay. So a parallel vector is basically um, vectors that can be in the same direction or opposite direction, right? But that don't meet, okay? And they're basically going in relatively the same or opposite direction, okay? So these are examples of parallel vectors. So let's call this guy vector A, this is vector B, this is vector C, right? And the way we can show the notation here is vector, vector A, A is parallel to vector B, which is parallel to vector C. These are all parallel to each other. Okay. However, we can notice that um, they're not the same magnitude. Okay. So they parallel vectors don't have to have the same magnitude, right? Do not have to have the same magnitude. Okay. They basically have the same or opposite direction, same or opposite direction. And parallel vectors are vectors that don't meet. Vectors that do not meet, okay? But vectors that are parallel but in the same direction, they're called collinear vectors. Like for instance, A is parallel to vector C, but A and C, vectors A and vector C are also collinear. So collinear is just two pairs of parallel vectors that are in the same direction, okay? So parallel vectors in the same direction. Okay. The next type of vector that we're going to be looking at, so this is a parallel vector. Next type of vector that we're going to be looking at is called an opposite vector. Whoops. So opposite vectors are basically vectors that have the same magnitude but opposite direction. Okay, so if you have a vector, let's say that this is uh, this is vector A here, or let's call this vector B. This is vector B. Then if you apply a negative to vector B, what happens here? This is negative vector B. Okay, now if you looked at the magnitude of vector B, this is two units. If we use the Cartesian plane, let's say that this is two units, right? Negative vector B is going to have the same magnitude, it's still a length of two units, except this is going right and this is going left. Okay? When you apply a negative, it creates an opposite vector. It, it switches the direction. So in that sense, an opposite vector is basically uh, vectors with the same magnitude, but opposite direction. So another example of an opposite vector, if I uh, say this is a vector, vector D, then negative vector D is going to kind of look like that. Okay, and both D and negative D are going to have the same unit, like they're, they're going to have the same length, right? So the magnitude is the same, it's just opposite in direction. 
Okay, so that's what an opposite vector is. So you should kind of understand this terminology um, for the three types of three main types of vectors. For the time being, we're going to focus on geometric vectors, then we'll move on to Cartesian vectors. All right, let's look at adding and subtracting geometric vectors. So let's say that this is vector a. Okay, and I'm going to use a different color here. Say that this is vector b. We'll have a few vectors. And this is vector C. Okay. So say I wanted to add two vectors together. Let's say we're adding vectors A plus vector B. Now the sum of these two vectors is called the resultant vector. But you can call the resultant vector A plus B, right? When you're adding vectors, um, there's really two methods of adding vectors. Normally when you add vectors, you add vectors tail to tip and tip to tail. Okay. Now the two methods for adding vectors is called the triangular method or the parallelogram method. You can use either or method, it doesn't matter. Okay. So I'm going to show you guys how to add vectors using the triangular method. So let's say we're doing vectors a plus b, right? So if we're doing vectors a plus b, um, you can notice that vector a, now I'm going to say that the magnitude here is two units. So it's uh, two of these squares. Uh, the magnitude of vector b is also two units going downwards. And the magnitude of vector c, um, in this case, I made a diagonal between the two squares. If you use Pythagorean theorem, this is two and two. Uh, let's say that this is uh, square root, what is that, eight? Okay, so let's say it's square root eight units. So the magnitude of vector C is eight units. Okay, and there's a certain directionality with them. Anyways, if we're adding vector A plus vector B, if I'm using the triangular method, I'm gonna first draw that vector A. You start with vector A, so this is the initial point, right? So the tail end of vector A is the initial point. Then I add vector B's tail to the tip of vector A. So this is vector B, and add it this way. And the result in vector, this is where I ended up. This is my final spot. So I started here in the initial spot of the tail of vector A. This is my final spot. The resultant vector is um, a vector that goes from the initial directly to the final. So this is my resultant vector A plus B. Okay, so it's like the shortest distance from where you started to where you ended off. Okay, so that's, that's the resultant vector A plus B. This is called the triangular method of vector addition, right? Um, you can also use the rectangular method depending on if you start with the same two vectors at the origin. Like for instance, if I had uh, vector A positioned here, so this is vector A, if this is vector B, okay, and if I wanted to use a rectangular method, so this is vector B, this is vector A, you can note that I just pick one of um, one of the two vectors. I can, if I start a vector A, then I can project vector B onto vector A as such. Okay, so this would be vector B. So it's like me copying, pasting this vector here. It's like me moving this vector there. And then what you could do here is you can find the result, and you can notice that you get the same answer. You get the exact same answer, same direction, same magnitude, right? So this is like the triangular method. And the rectangular method is when you position the two vectors at the same point, and then you can kind of project one vector onto the other. At the end of the day, you're still adding the vectors tail to tip, tip to tail, okay? So you can use either or method, it doesn't matter. Okay, so that's vector A plus B. We're going to also show that um, vector B plus A is the same as vector A plus B, right? Let's test to see B plus A here. Okay, so let's test B plus A. This time we start with vector B. So vector B starts here. Okay, so this is vector B. I'm going to add vector A to vector B. Okay, so I'm just going to use a triangular method. So then you, so you, what you do is you start with the initial point. So this is the tail of vector B. And then you add the vectors, uh, tail to tip, tip to tail. This is vector A. 
which is also two units, right? And then this is the final point. And you can notice here that your resultant always goes from initial to final. So from the initial tip, uh, tail end to the final tip end. And you can see that this is vector A plus B. It's exactly the same as, so, as shown, right? So therefore we can say that vector A plus B is equal to vector B plus A. So you can actually reverse the order of vector addition and it, give you the, it gives you the same result in vector, right? So when you can reverse the order and it gives you the same value, this is what we call a commutative property. So an example of a commutative property, like three times four is equal to four times three. It's like you can reverse the order, but you get the same value. Now let's take a look at another vector addition. Let's say, say we're looking at vector C this time. Let's say I'm adding vector a plus vector B plus vector C. Okay, and you can reverse the order, it doesn't matter because vector addition is commutative. So if I'm adding vector A plus vector B plus vector C, I start with vector A, let's say I started here. Okay, so this is vector A. Then I add vector B to vector A, so tail to tip, tip to tail. So this is vector B. And then I add vector C to the tip end of vector B, so this is vector C. I want to use the squares here. Okay, so this is vector C, and in this case, this is where I started, because I started with the tail end of vector A, and I ended up with the tip end of vector C. So the result in vector looks like this. It goes from the initial point to the final point. You guys see that? So that's your result in vector. So this is the vector. The result in vector is the sum of the vectors. It's vector A plus vector B plus vector C. Okay. So this notion of result in vector is just a, it's a vector that is a sum of multiple vectors. Resultant vector. So it's a, a vector that is a sum of two or more vectors. Okay, so that's what a resultant vector is. Okay, and we also discussed um, opposite vectors. Well, if I take one vector, like for instance, if I do, this is vector A, right, and let's say magnitude of vector A, we said was two units. If I find the opposite vector of A, then negative A will look like this. Okay, so it's the same magnitude, it's two units, whoops, let me just uh, make that a little bit more clear. It's the same magnitude, it's two units, but it's going in the opposite direction, okay? And if I add vector A with its opposite vector, negative A, you can see that you basically will go here, this is vector A, then you add negative A, you go back, and you actually go back to your initial point. Your initial point is equal to your final point, in this case, this gives you something called a zero vector. The vectors cancel out. So zero vector, which is shown like that, um, is the sum of a vector and its opposite vector. Okay, so that's an example of vector addition. Um, next, what we're going to do is we're going to look at vector subtraction. Okay, so vector subtraction is pretty much the same thing, except we're just adding the opposite vector. So let's just kind of draw some vectors out to demonstrate this. So this is vector A. Okay, I'm gonna make a few different vectors here. Uh, this time, let's say this is vector B. And let's say this is vector C. Okay, so I'm just kind of using the grid system here. The magnitude of vector A here looks like Magnitude of vector A is two units. The magnitude of vector B here is also two units, but you can notice that the direction is different. That's why we have to indicate that we're looking just at the magnitude, right? Because we can't say vector A uh, is equal to vector B because they're in different directions. So if you do make this statement, that, that means that they have to have the same value and the same direction, right? And the magnitude of vector C here is, I'm gonna say that this is one by one, so it's square root two units. Yeah, so it's like 1.4 approximately. Anyways, so you have these two vectors. Now I'm just gonna 
go over vector addition one more time. So say I'm doing vector A plus vector B plus vector C. Okay, I want to find my result in vector, right? So if I want to find my result in vector, so what I do is I can start at vector A, and it doesn't matter which order you do it in. We showed that vector addition is commutative, right? So in this case, I'm going to start at vector A. So this is vector A here, right? I'm going to make some space here. So I'll start at vector A. So this is vector A. Then I'm going to add vector B to vector A. So if I add vector B to vector A, I'm going to um, the tail, the tip end is here, and this is vector B. This is also two units. And then I'm going to add vector C to vector B. So you're adding vectors, tail to tip, tip to tail, right, and so forth. Okay, so whoops. Let me just uh, move that. Should be here. Okay. So this is basically where you ended up. So I started here. This was my initial spot. I ended here, the tip end, in my final spot. My result in vector is my direct distance from my initial spot to my final spot. So this is my result in, right? So you just go directly there. So this is the result in vector A plus B plus C, or you can call it result in vector R if you want. So that's the result in vector. So that's what we showed with addition. Now let's take a look at vector subtraction. So let's say I have vector A minus vector B. Okay, so say I, I was looking at something like this, right? So if I wanted to find vector A minus vector B, one way you can look at this is you can write this as vector A plus negative vector B. And negative vector B is the opposite vector of vector B. Okay, so it's an opposite vector of vector B. So if B, vector B looks like that, uh, negative vector B will basically kind of look like this. This goes in the opposite direction. So this is negative vector B. So if you're doing vector A minus vector B, then in that case, you're basically doing vector A minus vector B. You're doing vector A plus negative vector B, which is, this is vector A, negative vector B. I'm just going to move down here a little bit. Negative vector B is somewhere here. You're adding negative vector B. And now the result in here is this is where you started, this is where you ended, and your this is your result. And this is vector A minus vector B. Okay, so that's your resultant. Now we want to show is this commutative? What that means is does vector A minus vector B equal vector B minus vector A? So this is our question. Okay, is it commutative? Can I reverse the order and get the same value? Well, this is vector A minus vector B. Let's figure out what vector B minus vector A is, right? Now this time, when you're doing vector B minus vector A, you're doing vector B plus negative vector A, right? So negative vector A is going to look like this. It's going to be the opposite of vector A. So this is negative vector A, right? And if you're doing B plus negative vector A, um, this is vector B. Okay, so I'm going to add vector B to negative vector A. Let me just redo that here. So this is vector B, positive vector B. This is negative vector A. And you can see that the resultant is going in a different direction now, right? So you can see that the direction of the resultant is going this way now, because this is the initial spot, this is the final. So this is B minus vector A. So this indicates that A minus B is not equal to B minus A. So therefore, vector subtraction is not commutative. Vector addition is commutative, but vector subtraction is not commutative. So when you're doing vector subtraction, you're just adding the opposite vector of a particular vector, right? So, and basically you would reverse the direction and then you would just add the vectors tip to, uh, tail to tip, tip to tail. Okay, so I'm just going to draw these vectors. Uh, displacement of 40 meters east. You want to draw this using a scale. Um, in this case, I don't really have enough room, so I'm just going to draw a sketch for each. So 40 meters each. I'm going to use the coordinate bearing system. This is north, east, south, west. So you're basically creating a vector that looks like that. Okay.
Um, normally you would have to measure this out and create a scale, but I'm just going to kind of go through this just by drawing sketches. Okay, velocity of 100 kilometers an hour at a bearing of 35 degrees. Because we're using the true bearing system, right, what we're going to see here is we're going to start at 0 degrees up top at, at north. Mm -hmm. And we're going to go 35 degrees on a clockwise fashion. So this is 35 degrees. And then this vector's length should be at 10, 100 kilometers an hour. Okay, okay so it always goes clockwise, right? Yeah, it's always right. going to be a clockwise rotation. Um, your voice is going to be in this, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, force of 5,000 newtons um, upward. So in that sense, if we're looking at upward, you can just assume that it's north. So we'll just say that it's here. Okay, so this is 5,000 newtons. Okay, D, uh, acceleration of 10 meters per second squared downward. That's also known as acceleration due to gravity. Okay, so this is your graph. All right, so you're basically going down by um, 10 meters per second squared. Okay, then part E. Displacement of 2,000 miles on a bearing of 250 degrees. So, part oh sorry, part E is uh, velocity 50 kilometers an hour at a coordinate bearing of south 20 degrees east. So south 20 degrees east. So we start at south, and we go 20 degrees east. So let's say this is 20 degrees. This is east, and the magnitude of this vector is going to be 2,000 miles. Oh, did I look at the wrong question? Oh, sorry, it's 50 kilometers an hour. Sorry about that. Yep. So it's 50 kilometers an hour. Okay, part F. Okay, so part F, we have displacement of 2,000 miles on a bearing of 250 degrees. So bearing of 250, you start at north, 0 degrees. You go all the way clockwise to 250. Oh no, that is so whack. I'm sorry, man. <laughs> okay, this probably wasn't my best one, but um, so if you're going 2,000 miles on a bearing of 250, then basically what you're doing here is you're going clockwise. This is to this is 180, and then 250 is going to be in between the 180 to 270 mark. So let's say it's here. So this is going to be 20 degrees because this whole thing is 270. Right, and then this portion here would be uh, 250. Okay, and then the magnitude of this vector here would be 2,000 miles. Okay, I'm just gonna clear up some space. Okay, then we have a force of 600 newtons at 15 degrees to the horizontal, and in this case, um, we're not given a quadrant system, right? If I let the quarter, uh, the horizontal equal zero degrees, and you could apply a quadrant system to this if you really wanted to, right? If the horizontal was east, then if you're doing 50 degrees to the horizontal, um, usually what you'd have to do, if it's 15 degrees to the horizontal, it's going to be a counterclockwise rotation, okay? Now this is really common for forces and so forth, right? They are um, when you make the reference point the horizontal axis, the x-axis, then it's always a counterclockwise rotation. Think about angles in standard form, and then this would be 600 newtons. Okay, now this wouldn't be too common, but just kind of notice it. Um, and then for part h, two forces that are 500 newtons at 30 degrees to each other. So in this case, we're not really using a quadrant bearing or uh, true bearing system. We're just drawing vectors in space, right? If you're looking at two forces that are 500 newtons to each other, this would be 30 degrees. Okay, they're supposed to be 30 degrees to each other. Okay, so you would just draw it like that. An angle, right? Yeah. So, so in some cases you don't like. In some cases you wouldn't have to look at a quadrant bearing or true bearing system. Um, in the case where we're just looking at like tension force and so forth, right? So that's also another thing that we'll kind of take a look at. But for the most part, the true bearing and quadrant bearing systems are going to be relevant.
Okay, we want to express the shortest vector in each diagram as the sum or difference of other the two other vectors. So part A, we have the shortest vector here is vector w, and you want to write this as a sum or difference of the other two vectors, in this case u and v. So if vector w is starting here, ending here, right, uh, what we could do here is if we wanted to just do the vectors tail to tip, tip to tail, I'm just going to do negative u. So vector v minus vector u is equal to vector w, right? So or you can write this as vector u plus negative vector u. Vector v plus negative vector u. Then you get an opposite vector of u. It's equal to w. Okay, so you would just kind of write it like that because this will give you this. For part b, your shortest vector here is vector a, b. So this is your vector. So that's your shortest vector. You want to make vector a, b is sum of vector a, c, and c, b. So because a, c is already going this way, uh, I'm just going to make, instead of b, c, I'm going to make c, b go this way. right? So you can either write this as vector a, b is equal to vector a, c minus b, c. Or you can write this as vector a, b is equal to vector a, c plus c, b. Part C, your smallest vector here is RQ, right? So we started here, we ended off here, right? So to do that, I'm just gonna make, I'm just gonna start here and then make this vector the opposite vector. So in this case, you have, um, this is RP. So you can write vector RQ as RP plus PQ. Or you can write this as vector RQ is equal to um, negative PR plus RQ. Or you can write this as RQ minus PR. It's the same thing. OK, so it's just kind of good to understand all of the methods. And part D, um, for looking at the shortest vector, it looks like vector E. OK, so there's multiple vectors here. Um, and we started here, so always start at the tail section, end up at the tip section of the resultant. And uh, if I wanted to go that way, I could basically just um, take vector G, we can make this vector H, right? So we can call this um, vector negative H, okay? And then this is vector F. So we can go this way, so this is negative F. And we don't have vector v here. I don't know if they want you to, the sum or difference of two other vectors. Oh, just this two other vectors. So we don't have to use all the vectors. So we could do vector g minus vector h minus vector f is equal to vector e. Okay. Um, another way we can look at this, uh, if we were just looking at vector v and f, uh, we could look at this as vector v minus vector f is equal to vector e. Okay, so they just want you to look at it as two vectors. You don't have to use all the vectors. Okay, so for part A, um, if vector A is equal to vector B, this indicates that vector A and B are equivalent vectors. And in that sense, uh, if you have equivalent vectors, they have the same magnitude and same direction. So as a result, the magnitudes of the vectors would be exactly the same. Okay. Now in part B, if the magnitude of vector A is equal to vector B, then A is equal to B. Well, that's not true. If the magnitude of vector A is equal to vector B, this doesn't necessarily mean that these two are going to be equal in all scenarios. Okay. Um, even if you have the same magnitudes, you can have opposite directions. Like, for instance, this is uh, vector A. This is vector B, and they can go in opposite directions, but they have the same magnitude. So in that sense, you could potentially have opposite vectors. So that statement wouldn't always be true, um, or the exception. Okay, so that's more of a conceptual question. Okay, so given a parallelogram ABCD, what is the relationship between AB and DC? Well, if we're looking at AB, which is basically this vector, and for looking at vector DC. So basically when you write vectors, when you look at DC, this is the tail of the vector, this is the tip of the vector. Okay. So in this case, um, because they're going in the same direction, 
Um, and it looks like the magnitudes are the same because they are pa parallelograms. AB and DC are equivalent vectors. Okay, so these guys are equivalent vectors. If we're looking at vectors B, C, and D, A, so B, C, I'm just going to use a different color. So, uh, so B, C is from this end to that end. D, A is going this way. Okay. So remember, the tail is the one on the left. The tip is the one on the right. Right? Because they're going to different directions, but they have the same magnitude, then basically we would say that these are, thank you, these are opposite vectors, right? So we would say that DA and BC are opposite vectors, and you can write this as negative BC. Good? So these are opposite vectors. Okay, so in the diagram below, we have a parallel pipette. You're going to see this more later on. Uh, state one equivalent vector and one opposite vector for each of the following. Okay, so this is a really good question. So it's, it's a question that might come up. Um, if you're looking at an equivalent and an opposite vector, let's take a look at AB first. So this is AB, right? And if you're looking at an equivalent vector or AB, you can use the vector DC. Okay, so for vector AB, I'm going to write a column for equivalent and opposite. Right, equivalent vector is vector DC. An opposite vector of AB, you can look at GH, right? Or you can even look at CD. So I'll just use GH for the time being, right? Um, for vector ED, I'm going to use a different color for that. So for vector ED, which is here, um, an equivalent vector of vector ED looks like um, you can do HG, right? And an opposite vector of um, EF or oh shoot, ED. Where's ED here? This should be D here. <coughs> oh, I looked at the wrong one. Sorry. I looked at EF instead of ED. Okay, sorry. Let me just uh, change that. <coughs> so this was EF, but for ED. <coughs> basically from here to, I think it's here. That's ED. Right? Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. I looked at the wrong one. <clears throat> so that's ED. And another point that's similar to ED. FC? You could do FC. Yeah. FC. Wow, this makes everything so much more. Sorry. So ED is here. Yeah, you could say FC. <coughs> Good. So FC would work. Mm -hmm. Right? So FC works. And an opposite vector, you can just change it up. You can write CF. Okay. Um, so if you're looking at BD, which is there, right? Um, an equivalent vector to BD could look like, could do AF. Mm, that doesn't really look like it. I kind of covered it. Let's do that. No, we need to do FH. Yeah, FH works. That's good. FH works, yeah. So between BD, you could do FH. And then if you want to look at an opposite vector, you could look at, like, HF. Okay, and then FB. Okay, so if you're looking at FB, this is basically here, right? And you can compare that to GC, right? And basically, an opposite vector, you can use CG. Okay. Now, for part B, we're saying, does AG equal CE, right? So AG here, I'm just going to erase this. So AG is from this point to there, right? Does that equal CE? Well, CE is there, 
It wouldn't be equal because they're going in two different directions. So just off, we don't know what the magnitude is. It doesn't even look like the magnitude is the same. But we can see that AG is not equal to C. Okay. Okay, let's look at an application of that tradition and subtraction. Um, so in this case, M, MNPQ is a parallelogram. R is an intersection of the diagonals MP and NQ. Uh, if U is equal to MQ and V is equal to MN, determine the following vectors as combinations of U and V. Well, if we're looking at MP, for, for instance, MP is basically you start at point M and you end at point P. So this is the direction of MP. Right, NQ here is you start at point N and you end at point Q. Okay, so whenever you have a vector that's that's labeled, for instance, MP, and you have a vector arrow, P is the tip point, it's the point of the tip, and M is the point of the tail. Okay, so the one to the left is the point of the tail, the one to the right is the point of the tip. So try to remember that, um, but you can see that it's different if you have a uh, direction. PM, PM is the opposite vector of MP. So make sure you remember that, right? So like MP is equal to negative PM because PM would be the opposite direction of MP, but they would have the same magnitude, so they're opposite vectors. Okay, so keep this in mind. Um, just uh, likewise, if you have NQ, you can see that the direction goes this way. Uh, negative QN is gonna be, uh, QN is gonna be the opposite direction, so if I put a negative here, it offsets the direction, right? So in this case, um, make sure you write the order and make sure you look at the order effectively. So we're given that U is equivalent to MQ and V is equivalent to MN, right? These are just two examples of equivalent vectors. And we want to determine the following vectors as combinations of U and V. So I'm going to write a few examples of this. Right. So let's express each of these resultant vectors as, as a combination of uh, vector u and v. So we know that vector u here, I'm just going to um, erase these lines here. Okay, we'll redraw them. Now the thing about parallelograms, the diagonals, uh, where they intersect, this point, it creates a, a bisector, right? So this and this length is going to be the same, and this length and this length are going to be the same, right? So it basically creates a midpoint between the two. Um, now, if we're looking at M, uh, if we're looking at MQ, MQ is U, so I'm just going to draw that in red. So this is U. Okay, so this is vector U, and vector V is MN. So vector V, let's do it in blue. This is MN. Okay. And the first thing I want to look at here is MP. Okay, so if I want to look at vector MP, my resultant vector here is going to be all the way there. Okay, so that's MP. And you need to somehow add up to MP. Well, if you look at, if you start at vector um, U here, you can just add vector V to it and you get MP, right? Like, for instance, if this is V, then this is also V because they're both parallel and they have the same magnitude. Right? So this would be vector v, so you can just write vector u plus vector v is equal to mp. Okay, so you wanna your answer here is u plus v. You want to represent each resultant vector as a sum of u and v. Good. So that's the first case. Now let's look at um, part two. We have pn plus pq. Well, let's first figure out what pn and pq is. I'm just gonna redraw this. Okay, so once again, this is whoops. Okay, so this is vector u, and this is vector v. Okay, so this is vector u, this is vector v. We have pn and pq. I'm going to do here, I'm just going to make some copies of this. Copy this. Oh, that's weird. <laughs> 
guess that doesn't work. It is better. So let's say we're looking at PN plus PQ. So PN here is going to look like this. This is PN. PQ is going to look like this. Right, the resultant of this, if you add the two together, this would be uh, PQ, PN. The resultant would be that. Right, and you can see that PN is the opposite vector of U, right? So this is basically negative U, right? And PQ is the opposite vector of MN, which is negative V, right? So this should be negative V. Right, so you can rewrite this as negative u minus negative v, right? Or you can say plus negative v, so it's the same thing, right? So this is your answer. And the last scenario here, we have mr plus rn plus qp, right? So I'm just going to redraw this. Okay, so if we're looking at mr plus rn plus qp, so mr, mr is going to be... MR. I think this was MN. Oh, no, we have MR. Oh, this is R. Sorry, guys. So MR is this. RN is this. And QP is going to be this portion here. Right? But we know that QP is the same as V. And we know that MR plus RN is going to give us MN again. Right? So MR plus RN is going to give us V, and QP is also V, so we should get 2 vector V, okay? So that's the idea, right? So you're going to have to just kind of draw this out and uh, basically do vector addition based on inspection. Remember to add vectors tail to tip, tip to tail. All right, let's consider the forces F1 is equal to 200 newtons with a bearing of 220 degrees and F2 is equal to 100 newtons at a bearing of 310 degrees. Determine the resultant force. Now, if we want to find the resultant force, we're going to do, um, I'm going to call the resultant force F net. And F net here is the vector sum of these two forces. Now, there's two ways to do vector addition. You can either use geometric vector addition where you add vectors tail to tip, tip to tail, or you can use what I prefer, the algebraic method where you have to uh, break a vector down into a series of its components. Now I would advise you guys to use the algebraic method. I'm not going to be drawing the geometric. I'm not going to be utilizing the geometric method, but it is good to kind of draw this out so you guys can see a clear picture. So we're going to um, employ the algebraic method of vector addition here where we're going to look at components, right? The first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to draw out my vectors. Okay, so let's draw out like a plane here. And to do um, algebraic vector addition, it's advised to kind of um, use the quadrant bearing system. So this is north, east, south, west. Now we know that a true bearing system um, makes north zero degrees, right? And in a true bearing system, we look at angles as a clockwise rotation from zero degrees. and all the angles are in three digits, okay? So the first angle here is 220 degrees, and let's use um, blue for this, and this is force one. So if it's 220 degrees, we know that this is 180, right? So 220 here should be somewhere here, right? And you guys can draw a scale diagram for this where you can you know, create some kind of scale, like one centimeter is 100 newtons or something, right? But I'm just gonna sketch it for the time being because I am employing the algebraic component method of addition, of vector addition, and in this case we have, so this, this is 220 because this, this whole thing here is 180, then we know that this angle here is 40 degrees, okay, because 180 plus 40 is 220. Anyway, so now that we know this is 40 degrees, we also can understand that this is 50 degrees because south and west are complementary. That means that they add up to um, this whole angle here should be 90 degrees, right? So that's our first force vector, and it's 200 newtons, and the second force vector is basically going to be 310 degrees, so we're going to pass the 270 mark, which is here, right, so all of this, all of this is 270, and then we're going to go 40 more, and end up here. This should be half the size of F1, so this is F2, okay, so this is 40 degrees, 
What we want to do here is we're going to break down a vector into some of its components. A force 1 vector, you can write this as f1x, f1y. Okay, let's not do two commas because it makes it confusing. Right, so the x and y components of force 1x, right? And, um, and of force 1, sorry. Right, so this is the x component, this is the y component. Now, if we want to look at, we're just looking at the magnitudes for the time being, but if we wanted to look at um, each of these components individually, if we wanted to figure out their values, uh, f1x, if you look at this here, right, this portion here would be f1x. Okay, so this is f1x, right? We'll do that in red so you guys can clearly see it. Right, you have to create some kind of scale here. Okay, so this is f1x here. Um, you have to create some kind of um, arbitrary scale where left could be negative, right could be positive, or west could be negative, east could be positive, right? So in this case, um, if you wanted to find this value, we know the magnitude of the vector. Um, this is going to, we can use the cosine ratio, right? So as a result, we can understand that um, f1x here is negative cosine 50 degrees times 100, uh, 200 newtons. Right, because you guys can understand that if you use a cosine ratio and this is 90 degrees, right, this is going to be adjacent over hypotenuse, right? So, like, cosine 50 degrees is going to give you F1x over F1, which is basically F1x over 200, and as a result, F1x is 200 times uh, cosine 50. And the reason I put a negative here is because of the fact that we're saying that left is. Um, the negative direction, or west is the negative direction, right? So you can employ the same thing here to find um, the y component, right? Because if we look at 50 degrees as a reference ratio, then this is the opposite side. So sine 50 degrees is equal to f1y over f1. So f1y is f1 times cos cosine 50, and f1 is 200 newtons, right? So F1y here is 200 times sine 50 degrees, but you can imagine here that if we make north positive, and I'm going to say this is positive y, this is negative y, this is positive x, and you should start your scale off by um, looking at your positive and negative directions. Right? And you just have to keep it consistent. So if I make north positive, then I'm going to make south negative, right? So in this case, I'm going to calculate this. Um, so F1x here is 200 times cosine 50. And you're going to put a negative there because it's a negative direction. So it's negative 128.557. Okay? So we'll keep it with three decimal places for our calculations. And then 200 times sine 50 is 153.209. But we can understand that this is also negative because we're going the component vector is going downwards, right? So it's going down this way, right? And you're gonna do the same thing for F2. So F2 is located here, and F2 has a value of 100 newtons, okay? So if you wanna find F2x, right? F2x here, you're gonna use the cosine value, right? You can imagine here that it's also going left, but the, the Y value here is going up. Okay, so this is F2y, and this is F2x, all right? So F2x here is basically negative cosine 40 degrees times F2, which is 100 newtons. And I'm going to figure out what that value is, right? So you're going to do 100 times cosine 40, right? And that's going to give us negative 76.604. And F2y here... If I'm looking at this, it's because it's going up, it's going to be positive, so it's going to be positive sine 40 times 100 newtons, right? We'll leave the units at till the end, actually. It'll probably be easier, right? 100 times sine 40. This is going to give us positive 64.279, okay? Now that we have our x and y component of each, f2, the vector, is going to look like, I'm just going to... Um, move it here actually. F2 vector is going to look like um, negative 76.604 and 
this is f2x and um, f2y here is 64.279 and f1 is going to look like negative 128.557 and negative 153.209 okay well I'm not done yet I'm just gonna move it to the next page right I think I have the right values okay so these are our coordinates of our vectors right so th this is basically the component form of our vectors and the next thing you want to do here is if you want to find the results in vector f net you add these two together. So you add the x components together and the y components together. So you do one negative 128.558 uh, minus 76.604 and negative 153.209 plus 64.279. I'm going to punch that in my calculator. And what I'm going to get here is negative 205.16 and negative 88.93. Okay, so that's my resultant. So you're just going to add these two together. That's my resultant. And this is really useful because it tells you exactly where your resultant vector is located. Like if you look at your Cartesian plane, okay, and this was north, this was east, this is south, this is west. Right? So this is positive x, um, positive, sorry, positive y, positive x, negative y, negative x. Um, you can notice here that we have on the x coordinate we have basically negative 205.16 and we said that west is our negative direction so it's going to end up somewhere here okay, so we're going here this is negative 205.16 and then we're going down or we're going south 88.93 newtons right so we're basically going this way and this portion here is negative 88.93 and then this is your resultant vector. Okay, so this is why it's really useful, guys. You can actually pinpoint exactly where your resultant vector is. So this is your f net, right? And if we want to figure out the value of f net, we know that this is a 90 degree angle. We just use Pythagorean theorem. So f net here is equal to the square root of 205.16 squared, right? plus um, 88.93 squared. The reason I'm not employing a negative here is because the square would cancel out the negative anyway. So F net here is basically equal to approximately 223.6 newtons. Okay, guys? So this is basically your net end. Because we want to use significant digits here, I'm going to round this to 224 newtons. Okay, so that's your F net. That's the magnitude of your resultant force vector. Now what you want to do next is you want to figure out the angle and we have to figure out the angle in the true bearing system. So we want to figure out this angle. Now in order to figure out this angle you need to first figure out, we'll call this guy theta, you need to first figure out this angle. We'll call this guy beta. And you can find beta because this is a 90 degree angle. You can just basically use the tan ratio. Beta here is the tan inverse of 88.93, well, negative 88.93 over negative 205.16. This cancels out. And beta here is equal to basically approximately 23.44 degrees. Good? I'm going to round this to 23 degrees. Right? You can punch that in your calculator. Remember to keep your measurements in degrees. And the last step you want to do here is we know that this full three quarters up to this point, if we started at north, this is zero degrees, and you're doing clockwise rotations, it's 270. So if you want to find theta, you just do theta is equal to 270 degrees minus beta, which is 270 minus 23, which is 247. Okay, so our final answer here is therefore the net force, or the resultant force, is basically equal to approximately 224 newtons at a bearing of 247 degrees, and that's your answer. All right, let's consider the forces. Force one is 200 newtons with a bearing of 220 degrees, and force two is 100 newtons at a bearing of 310 degrees, determine the resultant force. Now, if we're using a true bearing system, we can understand that in a true bearing system, north, and I'm just gonna write the Cartesian rows here that everybody's kind of familiar with, right, northeast, southwest, North actually is the zero degree mark, okay? So it's a zero degree mark, and in a true bearing system, we look at angles, 
in three digits with degrees, and it's a clockwise rotation from zero degrees. Okay, so in the first angle in force one here, and remember this is a vector because it has a magnitude and a direction, is 220 degrees. Well, we know that this portion here is 180 degrees, right? So if we're looking at 210 degrees, then we're going to bypass this portion and we're going to end up somewhere here. Okay, now you would have to draw this to scale, right? I'm just kind of drawing a sketch here, but I would ideally prefer you guys to measure these vectors out. Okay, and you can use some kind of scale diagram like uh, one centimeter is a hundred newtons or something, right? So you have to do, you have to use a scale for this, but for our intensive purposes, I'm just gonna create a sketch here and just kind of work with that, right? But that's essentially what a scale diagram is. You're drawing a vector diagram using some kind of scale, some arbitrary scale that you've created. Anyways, so we're doing a clockwise rotation. So we've passed the 180 mark, and then this is um, 220. So as a result, this portion here should be 40 degrees. Okay, and we'll call this guy force one. So force one here is 200 newtons. And then what we want to do here is we want to look at force two, right? So force two is 100 newtons, so it should be half the size of force one, right? Um, and it should be a bearing of 310. So if it's a bearing of 310, uh, we know that this portion here should be 270 degrees, right? So all of this would be 270, right? So as a result, our vector should be, if it's at 310, we should have, we should end up here, right? And this should be force one. Now you want to make this smaller. And if you do measure this out, you can, you'll have a much more better uh, diagram than what I have here. So this is 40 degrees. And we know that this uh, magnitude here is 100 newtons, right? So force two here is 100 newtons. And we want to find the resultant vector. So if you're adding the geometric vectors, right? If you're adding geometric vectors, you want to add them tail to tip, tip to tail, and you can either use the triangular method or the rectangular method. Now I'm going to use um, the rectangular method here. What I'm going to do here is I'm just going to draw the projection. So remember, we're starting here, and I'm drawing the projection of force one to this vector, and we can understand that these two vectors are parallel, right? So I'm projecting this vector there. And because you started here, you ended off here, right? You guys can just draw the resultant somewhere there. Okay, whoops. So this is going to be much more exact if you guys actually measure this out, right? But you can draw the, the resultant somewhere there, right? Now, another way you can do this is you can just project this vector on there, right? And you can just find the resultant, right? So the resultant is basically where you end off. It's the shortest distance distance, right? So this is your resultant force, right? So this is your net force, okay? And this is your net force. Now what we want to do here is we want to figure out what this value is going to be, right? So if we take a look at our triangle, I'm just going to take my triangle and I'm going to just uh, copy and paste it here. So I'm just going to redraw the Cartesian plane really quickly, okay? And there is a much more effective method of doing this, but for the time being, we're just going to use some of our um, trig knowledge from our previous courses. So this is north, this is uh, east, this is south, this is west, okay? And we can understand that there is this vector, this is force one, right? This is 100 newtons, this is force, sorry, force two, right? And then we also have um, the projection of force one vector on this guy. Right, and we're left with a resultant vector that looks like this. Okay, uh, according to my diagram. Anyways, this is going to be 40 degrees. Okay, now we also can understand here that if this is 40, if this portion was 40, then this here should be 60. Right, so if this is uh, 60 and this is uh, 40, then this should be 100. Uh, degrees, right? Now, this whole thing would be 100 degrees. And we know that this portion here is parallel to this portion here. So this is, if this whole thing here is 100 degrees, right? This angle here should be 80 degrees. And the reason this angle is 80 degrees is because we have a C shape. This is called a co-interior angle. And a co-interior angle exists when you have two parallel lines, right? So if this line and this line are parallel, and this is A and this is B, right? 
angle A plus angle B should be equal to 180 degrees, right? And this, these are what we call co-interior angles. Okay, so if, this, if these two lines are parallel, and we know they're parallel because they're projections, then this angle here we said was 100, uh, was 60, and then this was 40, so this is 100, so this has to be 80. So this angle here is 80 degrees. Okay, and we know the magnitude of um, F1, and we know the magnitude of F2, right? So F1 here was 200 newtons, right? F2 here was 100 newtons, we know the angle in between, and if we want to find the result, then what we can utilize here is the cosine law, because we have an angle in between two side lengths, right? So if we're using the cosine law, right, and let's pretend that this is like, um, this is side length uh, A, this is side length B, and this is side length C, just, just for, um, just for simplicity's sake, right? So C squared is equal to A squared plus B squared minus 2AB cosine C. Okay, so this is what you guys want to kind of understand. And c squared here is a squared, which is basically, um, we said a is the 200 newtons. So 200 squared plus b here is the 100 squared minus 2 times 200 times 100 uh, cosine 80 degrees. Okay, so having said that, we can calculate this. If I punch this out of my calculator, I'll get, do you have a calculator? 54,415.489, and if I want to solve for C, I just do the square root of this, 54415.489. If I square root this, I get C here is 233.27, okay? I'm just gonna round to the nearest unit, so it's about 233 um, newtons. Okay, so that is your net force, your resulting force. Um, and we know that force is a vector, so we technically have to solve for its angle as well, right? So if we wanted to solve for its angle, um, we're going to understand that the angle associated with this, and you can actually find this a lot better if you guys, um, if you guys actually use your scale diagram to sketch it, but we're technically solving for this angle, okay? And... Um, in order to, f if we find this angle, then we can figure out what this angle here is, because we're using a true bearing system, and we just have to subtract by 270, because at this point, this is 270, right? Um, so what we're going to do for that is, we know, we know this angle, we know this side, and in this case, what you could do is you could do um, a sine ratio, right? Um, specifically, you can utilize sine law, right? So if you're using sine law here, so we know this side, we know this angle, and we can use this angle here and compare it to that side. So what I'm trying to say here is that we want to figure out this angle. We know this is 40, right? Right, I'm going to use sine law to figure that out because now I know what this side is. So as a result, we know that C, oops, we know that C over sine 80 degrees, right? Actually, you know what, let's find the angle. So let's, let's flip this around. So sine 80 degrees over C, which is basically what we just calculated, it's 233 is equal to this angle that we're trying to find. Let's call this guy theta. Okay, so let's call this angle, this full angle theta. Okay, so this is theta, is equal to sine theta over 200, right? So sine theta is equal to 200 times sine 80 over 233. Okay, this is somewhat tedious, and there is an easier way to do this, but we'll just kind of look at this using trig for the time being. Times sine 80. Um, should change my calculator. Make sure you change your calculators to degrees if it's in radians, guys. Um, you have sine 80. Divide this by 233, and you basically get 0 0.845. Okay, and then theta here is the sine inverse a 0 0.845, which is going to be about 57.67 degrees. Okay, so theta is equal to 57.67 degrees, about 58 degrees. So let's say that this is about 58 degrees. Okay, so this is 58 degrees, and we know that the initial angle here was 40, right? We know that this angle initially was 40. Okay, so this was 40 degrees. Then we want to figure out this portion here, the red portion, 
right? We want to figure out this red portion, right, to basically figure out what this angle is here. Because if we subtract by 270, we can actually figure out our total angle. So we know this is 58, so therefore this red portion here is 18 degrees because we subtracted from 40. And if we know this red portion is 18 degrees, then if you want to find the net angle, if you want to figure out this angle here, I'm just going to subtract it by 270, right? So we want to use the true bearing system. So 270 minus 18 is 252, right? So 270 degrees minus 18 degrees is 252. So our answer here, so we found the resultant force, right? We found the resultant force. I'm just going to erase this. But we found the resultant force, which is basically, um, therefore, the resultant force, or F net here, is equal to 233 newtons at a bearing of approximately 252 degrees. Okay, and that's your answer. All right, so an object is hanging from two ropes anchored to the ceiling. One of the ropes makes an angle 55 degrees with the ceiling and has a tension of 270 newtons. The other rope makes an angle of 42 degrees with the ceiling. What is the force of gravity pulling the object downward? So let's draw this diagram out. I'm just going to do that here. Okay, so. So let's say this is uh, the ceiling, and we basically have two ropes that are holding an object. Now the object here, let's say it's right here, and we have a rope. These are ropes in different colors. We have a rope. Oops. We have a rope here, and we have a rope here that's holding this object. And the object is going to be at something called static equilibrium. That means that the net force acting on the object is going to be zero. Right, so it's going to be in static equilibrium. We can understand that the the ropes here are going to have a tension force, right? So if this is uh, rope one, right? This is rope one, and this is rope two, right? There's going to be some kind of tension force that's going to be pulling up on the rope to hold this object together, right? And the object is going to have a force of gravity that's going to uh, pull on the rope, right? So this is your force of gravity. Okay, so this is the force of gravity, right? And we know that force of gravity is the mass times gravitational acceleration, and gravitational acceleration on Earth is 9.8 newtons per kilogram. So let's just keep this in mind. Um, so what is the force of gravity pulling the object down? We're just solving for Fg. We can understand that, uh, well, it tells us that the ropes make 55 degrees with a ceiling and a tension of 270. Let's say that this is 55 degrees, right? And the other rope makes an angle of 42 degrees with the ceiling, okay? So the one with that's 55 degrees is going to have a tension force, okay? I'll call this uh, tension 1. The tension force of rope 1 here is 270 newtons, okay? We don't know the tension force of rope 2. Uh, we're going to try to solve for that. But we know that because the ropes are holding the object in static equilibrium, we can understand that there should be a net force between the two ropes. We'll call this tension force 1. So if you add tension force 1 here, so let's call this tension 1. If you add tension 1 here to tension force 2, which I'm going to project out here, Okay, so this is tension 2. Right, that's the tension on rope 2, this is going to give us a resultant vector. And the resultant vector here, and I didn't draw this to scale too well, but the resultant vector here should offset the force of gravity. Okay, So this is tension 2. Okay, and remember that these are vectors. This is tension 1. So as a result, tension 1 plus tension 2 should be equal to the force of gravity. Right? So the net tension force should be equal to the force of gravity. Now the force, the net tension force is what we call the equilibrium force. Okay, so the equilibrium force, or the equilibrium vector, is the force that offsets the resultant force acting on the object. Right? So we know that the equilibrium force plus the resultant force should give us zero, a zero vector, and this in indicates that it's a static equilibrium. Okay, so the equilibrium force 
This vector should add up to this. These two should be opposite vectors. That means they are equal in magnitude but opposite in direction, and they cancel out. Now, we understand that this is two, uh, 270 and this is 42 degrees, right? And as a result, we can understand that this portion here and this portion here is parallel. If this is 42, this creates a Z shape. So this creates a series of alternate angles, right? And this um, equilibrium force, this force of gravity is going directly down. This one's going directly up. So this should be 90 degrees. So if this is 42 degrees, if this is 55, this is 90, then this here should be 35 degrees. Okay? So in order to solve for this, we also, so we know that this is 42 degrees plus 55 degrees, so this is an obtuse angle, which is basically going to give us 97 degrees. This is 35 degrees, so we can actually figure out this angle here. So this is 35, this is 97. We know that all the angles in a triangle, we know all the angles in a triangle add up to 180, so we have 180 minus 97 plus 35. So this angle here should be 48 degrees. Now our purpose here is to figure out this equilibrium force or this net tension force because we understand that the net tension force should be equal to the force of gravity. The magnitude should be the same. They're just going to be opposite in direction. The net tension force is going to be negative the force of gravity. Right? So these are two opposite vectors. In order to find this, I'm just going to be using sine law. And the reason I can use sine law is because I know this set, because we know tension 1 is 2, 270, and I can use this angle here for this set. Okay, So we know that the net tension force, according to sine law, A over sine A is equal to B over sine B. The net tension force over this angle, which is uh, sine 97 degrees, is equal to tension 1, which is 270, over um, sine 48 degrees. Okay, Or if you wanted to look at this in algebra, um, basically the net tension force over sine 97 degrees is equal to tension 1 over sine 48 degrees. Okay, And in this case, if you wanted to calculate for the net tension force, right, I'm going to multiply this to cancel out. I'm going to multiply this by sine 97, right? So the net tension force is equal to 270 times sine 97 over sine 48. I'm going to punch that in my calculator to find a net tension force. So I get 270 times sine 97 divided by sine 48. And that's going to give me 360.61. Okay, so this is your equilibrium force. It's the force that offsets gravity. So if the net tension force is going upwards, and let's say upwards is positive direction, right? It's positive 360 minus 61. Then the force of gravity should be negative 360.61 newtons. Does that make sense? So that is your force of gravity acting on the system at static equilibrium.